It's Thursday, the 2nd of April. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel, and this update is brought to you by you, the folks that sponsor this content on Patreon and PayPal. Thank you for your support. Unemployment numbers are in 6.6 .6 million folks applied for unemployment last week on top of the 3 million folks from the week before, nearly 10 million folks signing up for unemployment. So how are you doing economically? About 50% of our gross domestic product here in the United States is brought to you by small business. And the Payroll Protection Act is being rolled out by the Congress and the President, providing $350 billion in forgivable loans to small businesses across the United States. This will give small businesses about eight weeks worth of payroll protection if they do not lay off any of their employees. If they're able to pull that off, they're able to keep that money. They, they do not have to repay it. So are you a small business that's gonna take advantage of this loan program? Are you an employee at a small business that is considering this loan? Let us know in the comment section below. Not only does this represent the economic extent of this virus, but it also shows us that folks are heeding the advice to stay at home and not go to work. Well, in most cases, they have no choice because work is closed. 38 states now have stay at home orders, and I think most folks across the country are heeding the advice and staying at home. In airline news, well, last week, uh, March 26, we had that fatal crash of the aeromedical evacuation flight out of Manila in the Philippines involving a West Wind 2 jet. No survivors, it looks like a fire on takeoff. We really have no other information to go on at this time. This was operated by a charter company called Lion Air. One word, Lion Air, has nothing to do with Lion Air Airlines that we're talking about in the 737 MAX story. It sounds like even Southwest Airlines here at the United States is going to take advantage of the government bailout or airline loan program as they too are grounding nearly half of their fleet and laying off and potentially needing to lay off thousands of pilots. So Southwest will also be getting some government help. Over at American Airlines, snafu, situation normal, all fouled up. Remember on one of the previous updates we talked about the early retirement programs over at American Airlines. Nearly 620 pilots at American Airlines took them up on the early retirement program. And that was about most of the pilots that signed up for it. In addition to that, American Airlines was offering leaves of absences and over 4,500 pilots signed up for a leave of absence, either one, three, or six month leave. And it just absolutely overwhelmed the IT department at American Airlines. These leaves were to start on the 1st of April. The company couldn't figure out how to resolve the schedule that drastically, that quickly, and so they ended up canceling a lot of those leaves, and in the end, only 1,500 leaves have been granted out of the 4,500 pilots that wanted to take advantage of this leave program at this time. Hopefully, additional leave programs will be made available to the pilots at American Airlines. And this is all in an effort to help mitigate the costs of grounding the fleet. In my last update, we went over the Institute of Health Metrics Evaluation numbers on this COVID-19 virus, which is gonna hit us hard in the next two weeks. And we can't even begin to talk about airlines and aviation and other economic aspects until we get through this virus. So we gotta know and understand these numbers. Quite a few of the comments in the comment section from the last update some of you guys think that this is really no worse than the common flu and a lot of those comments came from pilots which leads me to believe that well just proves that you don't need to be very good at math to be a pilot this is substantially worse than the flu we're going to try to lead that horse to water today and show you in, in the numbers i'm going to forego the fancy yet tedious screen capture and go straight film the camera to the uh, computer here this is Chris Murray, Christopher Murray, a health economist and the head guy at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. It's his data here that the White House and Susan or Deborah Burks is using to determine 
their response to this pandemic. That's why this data is so important. So you can find this data at healthdata.org. Here's the state-by-state -state projections. Let's go with the United States of America. Again, this is uh, 2 April. Roll down here to the total number of deaths. And it looks like this number has been updated. Remember last time we talked about just two days ago, they were talking about 80, somewhere in the range of 80,000. They've upped that overall for the entire United States up to about 93,000 as they get new data each day, these projections adapt. The number of deaths per day have doubled in about two to three days, up to 900 deaths per day in the United States. Let's go back and look at California. The two states we looked at last time was California and New York. And when we go to a state level, you see the straight lines representing the straight purple line, all beds available, the straight green line down here, all ICU beds available. And this is a bit of a misery index to see how hard the facilities are going to get hit and where to best place our resources in each state and each loca location for this pandemic. Here in California, it looks like we're just going to meet, we're just going to hit the maximum available of ICU beds. So far, they're showing zero bed shortage, zero ICU bed shortage here for the state of California. This projection has lowered slightly. The total number of deaths in California are now projecting around 5,068, a slight decrease from just two days ago. Here's the actual data, the solid red line, and the projected data. Let's go over to New York now, and still New York is shown as being hit very hard. 63,000 bed shortage, 11,000 ICU bed shortage. I think those numbers are up slightly from two days ago. And here's where you see it on the graph, well exceeding the purple steady line and the green steady line way down here. And here's the actual death data coming in. And it looks like they're up to 401 per day. So it's the rate of doubling is what we want to talk about on a logarithmic scale. Total number of deaths in New York looks like they're now projecting 16,261. And all of this in New York is going to peak out pretty quick. April 10th, in a matter of days, Back in California, that's going to be delayed quite a bit. Looks like the peak is somewhere around April 27th, towards the end of the month. April 26th. Anytime you have data that's going up exponentially like this, very steep curve, it's hard to determine any rates of change in this data unless you lay it out on a logarithmic scale. Over here on the New York Times, they've done just that. Deaths by country, here we have, on the x-axis we have days, and on the y-axis we have number of deaths in a logarithmic scale. So they start with the country that first gets 25 deaths, and then from that day, counting on, and up here we have numbers of deaths, 10, 100, Double again, 1,000, double that again, 10,000. Now you can get an idea of rates of change. If your death rate doubles every day, your curve is gonna be very steep, looking like this. If your death rate doubles every two days, that curve begins to flatten out. Every th three days, looks like that, and every week looks like that. So if you take the tangent of one of these curves, like Italy, everybody's worried about the worst case uh, in Italy scenario, it started off doubling every two days and it's beginning to flatten out currently at about every eight days the death rate is doubling. So how does the United States compare to Italy? We're right here showing about a doubling of every two days paralleling about every two days a doubling of the death rate here in the United States. Here we can see mainland China has pretty well leveled off. Things are over the hump in China for this first wave. South Korea and Japan have been able to flatten that curve considerably with all the measures they've been taking. 
Here they've got a graph deaths by state, starting with uh, 10 deaths and then doubling 100 and 1,000 and then of course 10,000. And days since they first reached 10 deaths, 10, 20, 30 days. New York in the lead right here, and if you take the tangent of the curve at current, currently doubling every three days, that parallels this line right here. California down here, the current tangent is doubling every four days, and the rest of the states to follow. So what are the assumptions built into this U.S. model that's indicating a total of 93,000 deaths with a min range of 40,000 and a maximum range of about 180,000? And how does that compare to the annual flu virus? Well, of course, the big problem here is this virus, the coronavirus, the COVID-19, has no vaccine at this time. If we go over to the frequently asked questions on the IHME data, we see that this model includes social, social distancing. This model includes the effects of social distancing measures implemented at the first administrative level. In the U.S., it generally means at the state level and assumes continued social distancing until at least the end of May 2020. Our model suggests that with social distancing, the end of the first wave of the epidemic could occur by early June. The question of whether there will be a second wave of the epidemic will depend on what we do to avoid reintroducing COVID-19 into the population. So the only reason that this is only 93,500 estimated deaths in the United States is because of all the extraordinary measures everybody is taking right now. Had those measures not be taken in place, these numbers would be blown out of the water. So if we go over here to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, disease burden of influenza each year, which we do not stop the world for, we continue to work, but we have a vaccine for. By years, 2010, starting from 2010, we got illnesses, visits, hospitalization, and deaths over here. 2010, 2011, 37,000 estimated deaths here in the US. 2011, 2012, 12,000 estimated deaths. 43,000, 38,000, 51,000. Now they're still estimating the 2017, 2018 at a high of 61,000 deaths in the US for your standard flu season. These numbers are estimated by the CDC. They start with a, a sample rate from a sample of hospitals where they collect the data. They correct that for an under detection number, take that adjusted rate, extrapolate that to the entire U.S. population and come up with an estimated number of people hospitalized across the U.S. for the flu. Then they use the ratios to calculate the estimated number of people that actually got sick from the flu and they also using math once again, calculate using the death rates, the number of people that they estimated that died from the flu. So with a fundamental understanding of some basic mathematics and some common sense, you can see that this COVID-19 virus is substantially more dangerous than the common flu. So thanks for your support on Patreon and PayPal. I'll post a link to all these references in the comment section below. See you here.